This podcast is for general informational educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Welcome everybody to another episode of PHM from Pittsburgh. I am your host, Dr. Tony Tarcici. I'm a MedPeds trained pediatric hospitalist, in case you're new here, uh, at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh at the Paul C. Gaffney Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine. Now, as you all know, we are all dealing with COVID-19 and the repercussions of this pandemic. And there are places in the country more severely affected. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You know about New Orleans, about uh, New York, you know about it was D.C., these cities that are really hit very, very hard. In those cities, again, as you know, some of our pediatrician colleagues are being asked to see adult patients and take care of them because there are so many affected patients that the hospital just needs to do that. One of the things that has popped up to help them is something called the Popcorn Network. Uh, and my guest will introduce what the Popcorn Network is, but they have created a set of learning materials to help pediatricians rapidly understand and learn about adult medicine, which is very, very important. The Popcorn Network reached out to us at PHM from Pittsburgh asking if we would mind doing a couple of episodes on this helping to acclimate pediatricians or any physician who's not used to doing this taking care of adult patients with COVID-19. We, of course, said we'd be happy to do it, which brings us to this episode. I want you to know what to expect from this. This is not an all-encompassing review of internal medicine or family medicine. This is not a board review course. This is high yield, exactly as the title says, crash course. Information that the pediatricians who are taking care of adults need to take care of those adults. We're going to do our best to cover as much as we can. I'm going to introduce my guest today, and then he is going to tell you a little bit about the Popcorn Network. And what we have today is uh, this episode is going to be questions that were a- that were asked by pediatricians who are taking care of adults in the field right now. They have written the Popcorn Network or gotten a hold of them in one way or another and asked specific questions. We are going to go through them one by one and address them. Without further ado, and remember there's free CME credit from the University of Pittsburgh with every podcast. Let me introduce my special guest, Dr. Vignesh Doraswamy. After a varied and unexpected course leading him from Queens to South India to Florida, Dr. Doraswamy earned his MD from the University of South Florida with concentrations in both business and international medicine. In his, pers- in his pursuit to provide comprehensive care to all populations, he went, he went on to complete his residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at Penn State Health. There, he distinguished himself as an exceptional educator, innovator, and humanist through several quality and safety projects, curricular developments in health systems, and ultimately as chief resident. Today, he serves in a, as an assistant professor at The Ohio State University and Nationwide, Ch- Nationwide Children's Hospital as a med peds hospitalist. So he's doing actively doing both. He continues to be active in medical education and is now using his training and expertise to help prepare others take on COVID through this newly minted popcorn network. So, Dr. Doraswamy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Let's do our conflict of interest statements, and then we'll, you can tell us a little bit about the popcorn network. So I'll go first, then you. Absolutely. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, I do have nothing to disclose. All right, so please tell us, what is the Popcorn Network? How did it start? So uh, it stands for the Pediatric Overflow Planning Contingency Response Network, or Popcorn for short. It's a newly formed collaborative network with over 300 contributors who have come together to help all providers, but pediatricians in particular, or anyone who may not have really received any specific training in internal medicine. Our group is made up of medical students, residents, fellows, advanced practice providers, and physicians from a variety of backgrounds, um, internal medicine, med peds, family medicine, pediatrics, and subspecialists too. The primary goal is really to help support uh, safe offloading 
of care for adults, uh, possibly in pediatric focus centers. Uh, we have multiple working groups focusing on health systems operations, equity, educational material and resources, social media and communications, and of course, an outcomes and metrics work group so we can improve each and every day. Uh, you can find us on all the social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, and at popcornnetwork.org with a single N. Well, that sounds great. I am so happy you guys decided to do this because I think we need to get this information out in any way we can as soon as we can. So without really dragging this out, let's dive right in. So the questions we're going to discuss, if you're listening, are there was there's five specific questions. Delirium in adult uh, diagnosis and management. When to hold antihypertensives in an adult. Chest pain in adult evaluation. Diabetes, specifically holding oral basic bolus insulin. And here we're assuming it's type 2 diabetes. And then goals of care or end-of-life care discussions. So... Those are big topics. Let's start with our delirium in an adult. Now we'll do, what we're going to do is a little bit of a literature review. We're gonna, I'm going to make this brief. Then we're going to discuss it in the context of a pediatrician seeing an adult patient during this pandemic who they feel may have delirium, how to best go about it. To do the lit review, I really went through three major articles. The first is delirium in hospitalized older adults by Edward Mark Antonio et al., and it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on October 12, 2017. The second is Haloperidol and Zoprazidone for Treatment of Delirium and Critical Illness, again published in the New England Journal of Medicine, December 27, 2018. Authors are Gerard et al. And the third is Responding to 10 Common Delirium Misconceptions with, with Best Evidence and Educational Review for Clinicians, the author was Mark Oldham et al. This was published in the Journal of Neuropsychi Neuropsychiatry Clinical Neuroscience in 2018. I kind of put the information in these three journals together to create what we're going to talk about. So quickly, first, we have to start with the definition of delirium. And to, for that, you got to look for the DSM-5. And it states the presence of delirium requires all, all of the criteria to be met. All of them. And the criteria are... Disturbance in attention and awareness. Disturbance develops acutely and tends to fluctuate in severity. At least one additional disturbance in cognition. Disturbances are not better explained by a pre-existing dementia. And disturbances do not occur in the context of a severely reduced level of arousal or coma. And evidence of an underlying organic cause or causes. So those six criteria all have to be met to call it delirium. Now, rapidly here, delirium has been known about for a very long time. The article states for two millennia, but it's still not frequently recognized as much as it should be. It's common in hospitalized adults. A third of general medical patients who are 70 years or older have delirium, and of that third, half of them have the condition present on admission, and the other half it develops during their hospitalization. It is the most common surgical complication among older adults with incidences of 15 to 25 percent, and up to 50 percent after major electives, after high-risk procedures like hip, hip, hip fracture repair or cardiac surgery. It's very common in the ICU, and it can be associated with poor, short, and long-term outcomes in general. So that's kind of why we want to know about it. Now we're going to talk about it in a bit more detail. There's actually two types of delirium. There's hyperactive, which is the agitated type. It's the more common type. And there's hypoactive, which is a quiet type, which is usually associated with a poorer prognosis. But that's probably because it's less frequently recognized. The agitated type or the hyperactive type is the one you're most used to thinking about. This is the upset patient pulling out his IV, swinging their arms wildly, that patient. The hypoactive type is a patient not cooperating, not taking their medicines, not fighting, just not doing it, not eating, not drinking, not participating in physical therapy, hypoactive. So let's talk about the risk factors for delirium because it's important for you to figure those, to know those to really help make the diagnosis. The risk factors are split into two major groups. There's a predisposing group, which means these, these are the things that will predispose you to be more likely to have delirium. And there's a precipitating group, which are things which will precipitate or bring on a delirium. So, within the predisposing group, the risk factors for getting delirium are 
older age, dementia, functional disabilities, high burden of coexisting conditions, male sex, poor vision, poor hearing, depressive symptoms, mild cognitive impairment, lab abnormalities, and alcohol abuse. Within the precipitating group, the risk factors are drugs, especially sedative hypnotics and anticholinergics, surgery, anesthesia, higher pain levels, anemia, infections, and acute exacerbations of chronic illnesses, like COPD exacerbation. The way this works, honestly, is how you would expect it to work. The more predisposing factors you have, the fewer precipitating factors you need to give you delirium, which is why older, frail adults who have precipitating factors, which may seem minor to a younger adult, they will trigger delirium. In the hospital, delirium is a significant risk factor for complications, which we talked about. You can get a longer length of stay and discharge to a post-acute nursing facility more likely if you have delirium. Now, we're going to be talking about primarily younger patients. The assumption we are making, which is an assumption, is that if you're a pediatrician in a hospital taking care of adults because of a pandemic, they're going to try to give you the younger patients. And from what we've talked to the pediatricians who are doing this, that seems to be what's happening. So we're going to try to phrase this for pediatricians taking care of adults with COVID-19. So let's talk about the diagnosis. There was a study comparing clinical documentation and research assessments it suggested that only 12 to 35% of delirium cases are actually recognized when they went back and looked. The New England Journal of Medicine article, the first one, recommended a bedside assessment tool called the Confusion Assessment Method, or CAM for short. This, they said, is the most useful bedside assessment in multiple articles also. Both, all three articles talked about CAM. And it looks at four features. So this is how CAM works. It's a bedside assessment tool. There's four things. You have to have the first and second, have to, and then either one of the third or fourth. So the first two you must have in order to, for CAM to diagnose delirium. The first is an acute change in mental status with a fluctuating course. The second is inattention. So your patient has to have those first two things. Then they either have to have disorganized thinking or altered level of consciousness and then you can say they have delirium based on this CAM um, bedside assessment tool. Now, there's actually a specific CAM for everybody. The ICU has their own CAM. Pediatrics has their own CAM. Everyone's got a CAM. So quickly, we're going to review differential diagnosis for delirium. This is going to be short. It's dementia, depression, and acute psychiatric syndromes. So what do you do? You have this patient in front of you, and we've done our CAM. It's a young adult with COVID-19, and you're taking care of him, and you think he has delirium based on the CAM. So remember that a new diagnosis of delirium could mean that there's a potentially life-threatening emergency on your hands. So they recommend immediately, like we always recommend, to do immediate history and physical with a good neurologic exam and possibly some lab tests. Now, in the New England Journal of Medicine paper titled Delirium in Hospitalized Older Adults. They have a couple of really good tables. The first is table three, which I'm actually looking for now. This was by far the most helpful table in the paper. It goes through the evaluation and management of delirium, and it walks through a common modifiable contributor to delirium. And they talk about the mnemonic for delirium, which is actually delirium. So the D in terms of things you can look at, the first D is drugs. And when I talk to psychiatrists in preparation for this podcast, I want to first give a shout out to Dr. Krista McDermott, who I talked to numerous times about this, who was very helpful. Drugs specifically, newly initiated drugs, increased doses, interactions, over-the-counter drugs. Uh, something that she brought up was you may give your patient a benzo because they're nervous, worried, they have COVID-19, they're fearful, and you want to calm them down, that benzo could trigger delirium. On the flip side of that, you could have a patient coming out of the ICU who was intubated, who was hypoxemic, and he was perhaps or she was intubated for days because we know these patients are intubated for longer, so maybe weeks, and they've been on 
uh, benzos and they've been on maybe opioids and maybe accidentally the ICU stopped those medicines abruptly. Well, that withdrawal can trigger delirium. So look at drugs from both angles. Electrolyte disturbances. Again, if the patient's coming in from home and the ER was over full, which we're seeing on the news, especially in New York, and they weren't able to do labs right away, and the patient hasn't drank or eaten in days and has been very sick, the electrolyte disturbances from that may trigger delirium. Um, look at thyroid abnormalities. Maybe they have hypo or hyperthyroidism. They didn't take their medicine. Maybe they forgot. Maybe they didn't tell anybody. Lack of drugs. So if your patient is on opioids chronically, whether they're supposed to be or not, alcohol abuse, and again, we're talking about younger patients, so you may have to call their spouse, call their significant other, uh, ask them how much does he or she drink, uh, and ask them honestly, get specifics, get volumes, get how much per week. If they're going through three bottles of 1.75 liters of Crown Royal a week, that's a lot. They may be going through alcohol withdrawal, and that may be triggering delirium. The next one for delirium is eye infection. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Uh, SARS-2 coronavirus is, there's no treatment for it, irrespective of what we're, the, what the debate is in the national news. We went through this in our lad, po- last podcast. None of, none of the treatments have really borne out fruit yet. So we have to treat the symptomatology from it. Because remember, delirium may start abruptly. So if your patient abruptly gets delirium, look at what has changed in their clinical course. Meaning if all of a sudden they became dyspneic and hypoxic and, or hypoxemic and then they got delirium, you may have to correct the dyspnea and hypoxemia, maybe by putting them on CPAP or BiPAP or giving them oxygen, and that may correct the delirium. Look for these acutely, especially if it happens very acutely, which it will, look for what's changed. Um, and what, uh, what Dr. McDermott did tell me is when they get consults for a patient who has delirium, they spend a lot of time reviewing the MAR, the medical reconciliation, what the medicines the patient has been getting, looking specifically for abrupt changes or things that may have fallen off accidentally that may trigger it. Then reduce sensory input. Remember, if your patient has thick eyeglasses or a hearing aid or, you know, is hard of hearing and they didn't bring their glasses, they didn't bring their hearing aid because they just left the house quickly because they were in such bad shape, that reduced sensory input may trigger delirium. So maybe they need an assisted hearing device or someone can drop off their glasses if possible. And then because this article is specifically for older adults, we talk about intracranial disorders like infection, hemorrhage, stroke, tumor. So can keep them in the back of your mind, but for these younger patients, that may be less likely. Something I didn't know were these urinary and fecal disorders. Um, so like these cystocerebral syndrome, fecal impaction, urinary retention, that alone could trigger delirium. So you want to look and make sure the patient's stooling um, or uh, urinating. And back to infections quickly, look for secondary infections. If the patient was in the ICU for weeks at a time and had a Foley in, maybe they have a UTI now. Um, Maybe there's a pneumonia or something else that may have triggered a delirium in addition to the virus. Then, of course, myocardial and pulmonary disorders, if they had an MI, if they're having arrhythmia, heart failure, CHF exacerbation, hypotension, severe anemia, COPD exacerbation, and hypercarbia. And for for our younger patients, the 30, 40-year-olds, younger, 30, 40-year-old patients, you know, if they're morbidly obese, maybe they don't know they have obstructive sleep apnea. So maybe you want to do an ABG or a VBG looking for hypercarbia, or maybe they didn't bring their CPAP, forgot to tell you they have OSA and have a CPAP. So look for that as a potential cause. And, And in terms of what to do, once you've diagnosed it or you have it and you've looked at the potential, you've looked at the reasons why it could happen, you want to correct what you can correct. We talked about oxygen, helping the respiratory status. If hypotension is triggering because they're getting worse, giving them fluids, maybe pressors, maybe the ICU at that point. But environmental factors you can help with. First, you know, if patients coming out of the ICU, the ICU is one of those places where people flip their night and day very easily. So you want to reestablish night and day. So lights on during the day, off at night if possible. You put a calendar and a clock in the room if possible. Ideally, you want family there, but that can't happen in these COVID cases. So, you know, FaceTime with family as much as possible. Even a picture of that person's loved one by their bed may be helpful. Even one of the pictures from the nursing station from the crappy printers 
that in itself may be helpful. Um, and you then want to consider getting them back to sleeping at night. Something that's easy to use that's helpful is melatonin. Just giving them melatonin, letting them fall, get, letting them sleep more at night may help correct this if they're, if they're having trouble sleeping and that's triggering it. Look for pain as a potential cause. If they're in a lot of pain and they've been hiding it, uh, if, you, if you treat the pain, you may then get the delirium under control. Um, in addition to that, you may end up having to use drugs, especially if they're these hyperactive delirium and they're hitting or pulling out their IVs or harming themselves or the staff. I mean, you just can't let that go. So when you look at drugs to treat delirium in the acute inpatient setting, there's somewhat of a discussion in the literature, the disagreement on what to do. It generally seems to be that second-generation antipsychotics are used. Different places use different ones. Um, and there are side effects to them. So for this, the best table I found was Table 5 in that original New England Journal of Medicine article. It goes through all of the drugs, haloperidol, risperidone, olanzapine, quietapine, zoprazidone, and lorazepam. It, the major side effects they really worry about are these extrapyramidal symptoms, which you all know about. The, most, the highest ones to do it are haloperidol and risperidone. Everywhere uh, region you're at, some places will use quietapine more, some places will use suprazidone more. It depends on where you train. If you're going to use one, they may make the patient uh, sedated or tired. It's ideal then to do it at night, so they f hopefully fall asleep, give them some melatonin, and they, f and they feel better and do better. If you're going to get to that point, I would strongly recommend a psychiatry consult to assist you with this, depending upon where you are and if they're available. And again, if you want a list of medicines that can trigger delirium in patients, Table 4 in the same New England Journal of Medicine article has a really nice table of drugs that can are at higher risk for triggering delirium. And it's what you would expect. Benzos, opioids, sedative hypnotics like zolpidem, antihistamines, of course alcohol, anticholinergics, anticonvulsants, TCAs, histamine blockers, anti-Parkinsonian agents, antipsychotics, and barbiturates. So... After going through that, first of all, Vic, did I miss anything? Uh, not that I can think of. I actually love that uh, paper from the New England Journal of Medicine myself. I think it's fantastic. Um, I, I really don't think you missed anything at all that I'd want to say. Do you, in your practice, when you're seeing adults regularly, do you use the CAM assessment tool at bedside? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's sort of uh, what everyone uses where they train. And like you said, there's different CAMs for different scenarios. But I... Um, I use the CAM tool pretty much for any patient when I'm thinking about delirium, um, so pretty much all the time. And uh, do you find that the environmental things like the lights off at night, um, you know, the picture, the calendar, all that, do you find that that helps these patients? I'm very, very glad you asked. I would say more than anything else, and even though we, don't, we may not think so, that I have found to be the greatest sort of tool that we have at our disposal. I'm lucky enough to work in a place where we have what we call a geriatric neighborhood. One of our units is uh, specifically considered the geriatric neighborhood. We have nurses who are trained to take care of folks who have delirium. And really what they do is establishing day night cycles, frequent reorientation, having TV and uh, music on during the day to not allow the patient to sleep during the day a little bit, making sure we give them a little bit of melatonin as a chronobiotic, maybe at seven or eight o'clock. Um, we have them in sunny, sunside facing rooms, so we have the shades up, the light comes in. I find that to be probably even better than anything else we have. Uh, one of the things there are, was the third article talked about a fair bit was if you have a patient who goes in acute delirium, there's oftentimes more than one modifiable cause for the delirium. And you have to maybe fix a couple of things to get the patient back. Uh, do you find that to be the case? Uh, absolutely. One of the things we were always taught early on is uh, just because you found one cause of delirium, don't stop looking. It's often very multifactorial. Like you said, if someone is coming in with COVID-19, it may be related to their infection, the drugs, their ICU stay. Uh, so I always keep looking um, to make sure that we don't miss something else. Okay. And then they did talk about the nursing staff and other staff being trained in these de-escalation techniques for the patient, which is helpful. Uh, have you seen, you know, in your practice, have you seen delirium in a 30, 40 year old patient? Uh, quite often, I would say. And you mentioned this earlier. I often see them in patients who perhaps have had longer ICU stays, uh, who are just coming out of the ICU. They've been extubated for a while. Maybe they've been on sedative drips. Uh, and that's a very common population for me to see delirium. Certainly not as commonly as I see in folks who have those risk factors and limited cognitive reserve. But absolutely, 30, 40 year olds are. Uh, 
are not uh, accepted from having this, they certainly can get it too. All right. Well, then let's get to our next one. And I believe our next question we're going to discuss that they asked us is when to hold antihypertensives in an adult. Vig, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. So this is actually a great question. And I spoke to a lot of different people on getting this question because I think that if you ask a bunch of different doctors, you'll get a bunch of different answers. So I think I maybe want to approach this briefly by talking about when to hold various classes of antihypertensives, but big picture, I think, for all antihypertensives, a good reason to potentially hold any of them would be um, states where you are already worried about lower blood pressure. So anyone who's coming in with sepsis, I think it's always reasonable to hold their, hold their antihypertensives because you're already worried about hypotension. You don't want to make it worse. And similarly, anyone who is hypotensive, if they're orthostatic, they're, they've come in for syncope, they're complaining of dizziness. I think it's always reasonable to sort of hold or stop their antihypertensives. After that, however, it becomes a little bit more tricky because Every class has its own uh, reasons for why you might be on that medication, and not always are antihypertensives used for um, antihypertensive purposes. So if we quickly uh, just go through some of the broader classes, you have your calcium channel blockers, uh, you have your dihydropyridines like your amlodipine, nifedipine, and your non-dihydropyridine like diltiazem and brapamil. The non-dihydropyridine medications can often be used as rate control in folks who may have atrial fibrillation and flutter. And so discontinuing that can often lead them to have rapid ventricular responses, which is something we want to avoid. So that's something to be careful when you abruptly withdraw. Uh, similarly, for the dihydropyridine uh, blocker, uh, calcium channel blockers, if they're not on concurrent beta blockade, uh, abruptly withdrawing it could lead to reflex tachycardia or even uh, resultant angina. So that's something to be careful. But if they're mostly on it for just blood pressure control, calcium channel blockers, mostly you'll see folks on nifedipine or amlodipine. Those are reasonably safe to withhold if you need to, if the patient is hypotensive or some other reason. Um, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers is actually a good one to talk about. And I'll briefly throw in a little COVID plug here. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about the proposed mechanism of SARS-CoV-2 going in through the ACE2 receptor and causing issues. Uh, and so people are wondering, should I stop it? Should I not stop it? I, every major uh, organization that can make a recommendation has recommended that we continue these medicines uh, for now, unless we have any more data. And for now, I think we have no such data. But one of the, the way that the ACE inhibitors and ARP uh, can work also affects the GFR. Uh, and there's usually a modest 5 to 25% reduction in GFR. Um, usually in folks who have hypertensive nephrosclerosis, heart failure, um, kidney disease. So in each of these patients, if you think about it, their intrarenal perfusion is already um, a little reduced. And so GFR in these patients is often maintained by an angiotensin 2 induced uh, increase in resistance. So basically their efferent arterial is a little vasoconstricted, but if you put them on an ACE or ARB or if they're already on one, that could potentially um, relax the efferent arterial and further reduce GFR. So that's a long-winded talk. But I, I say that because if you have a patient who's coming in with acute kidney injury, it's very common practice to hold their angiotensin receptor blocker or their ACE inhibitor. Uh, it's a little controversial. You can talk to some nephrologists who will say you should absolutely continue and it's totally fine. But most people would say that if someone has acute kidney injury, it would be a very reasonable reason, um, reason to stop ACEs and ARBs. A lot of people also say you should maybe stop them before uh, surgeries. I don't think our adult docs, or, or sorry, our pediatricians are taking care of adults, hopefully are taking care of folks who are pre-op, but uh, usually you may want to hold it to prevent intraoperative hypotension. But the good news with uh, ACEs and ARBs is there's no real major effect that you may run into with abrupt cessation, uh, besides maybe the blood pressure going up, but usually we're holding it in cases where we don't want it to um, go down any further. So um, the next class I'll briefly talk about are thiazides and thiazide likes, uh, like your um, hydrochlorothiazide and then your like drugs, uh, chlorothaladone. So these work by reducing volume. So the easiest way for me to remember why not to, or why to hold this medicine is I would hold it again for the same reasons as before. If someone is dizzy, has hypotension, we're worried about sepsis. But um, again, this is another preoperative one that sometimes people ask to hold because you don't want to make sure someone is going to be volume depleted before surgery and maybe be more prone to intraoperative hypotension. But thiazides, by the, their very mechanism of how they work, um, have dose-dependent effects uh, on the electrolytes. So they can cause hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hyponatremia. Uh, so that's something to think about. If your patient has any of those electrolyte abnormalities where you have low mag K or sodium, that could be because of their thiazide. Uh, additionally, uh, it can cause hyper 
uricemia, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, and hypercalcemia, though rarely is that an issue in the acute setting. But if someone does have hypercalcemia, holding a thiazide may be reasonable. And again, because this is a volume issue, if someone has uh, hypertension and maybe they come in and they're coming in with gastroenteritis, they're having their volume down for any other reason, uh, and they're having an acute kidney injury, especially if you suspect it might be a prerenal injury, holding a thiazide or thiazide-like diuretic, again, would be a reasonable thing to do. Uh, alpha blockers aren't really used that often. Actually, to go back to thiazides for just a second, again, like, like I said, for every drug, think about the indication. Some folks are on thiazides because they have calcium stones, in which case we kind of want uh, them to be on their thiazide. But again, it's all within the context. So if we go to alpha blockers, these are not first line drugs anymore. So your hydralazine, doxazacin, and terazacin. Uh, but sometimes the second two that I mentioned, the latter can be used for BPH. So again, figure out what the indication is for. Uh, hydralazine is often... You hey, can I interrupt you? Do you, want, do you want to talk to people what BPH is for the pediatricians who aren't? Oh, certainly. Absolutely. Um, so benign uh, prostatic hyperplasia or hypertrophy. Uh, thanks for reminding me. So if and you know so if you have an older um, male patient that might be what's what's going on. So uh, holding that medicine again doesn't cause a huge issue in the short term, but most folks aren't on these meds as much anymore. Abrupt cessation of an alpha blocker can lead to reflex tachycardia. Uh, usually, if you're you know weaning someone from clonidine or something as an outpatient, you do it slowly. But you, I don't think you'll find too many patients on these medications. There's one absolute contraindication that I can think of, which is coronary artery disease. Uh, if you have coronary artery disease and you know your patient has it, they probably shouldn't be on hydralazine. But again, ideally, that wouldn't be a situation that you encounter. Do you uh, have... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I was no, gonna, go ahead. Do you have a blood pressure that you say for any patient, if they get under this, whether it's systolic or diastolic, and I'm remembering from my residency in internal medicine, 90 over 50, uh, if they're under this, I'm stopping their antihypertensives. Uh, I think your recollection is quite... Right. Everyone's a little bit different. Um, I usually use 95 over 55, but most people that I work with actually do have their hold parameters to say 90. Again, just some caveats. Uh, older, thinner adults in their 70s and 80s often run low, uh, and the 90s might be quite normal for them. Uh, patients who have cirrhosis, if you're taking care of them, will often run low, and we have lower mean arterial pressure map goals for them of maybe in the 55, 60 range. But in general, um, uh, 90 to 90 or 95 systolics or a 50 to 55 diastolic is a, is a good reason to hold. Um, general practice at our hospital is all patients who are on antihypertensives. If the med is ordered, it should have some sort of hold parameters ordered as well. Okay. Um, I think really the last major class would be beta blockers, and they have varying degrees of uh, hypertensive effect. Some medications that may have alpha um, activity as well, like carvedilol, may have more uh antihypertensive effect than others. So these are ones that, again, um, if you have, you have to figure out why they're on it. Beta blockers, of course, help reduce myocardial oxygen demand uh, for folks who have heart failure or coronary artery disease. So the one concern is, and one of the most important concerns, is that if you stop someone who is on it for um, coronary artery disease, you, the withdrawal can lead to exacerbation of their ischemic symptoms, including even the precipitation of an acute MI. Oh. So that's something very important to consider with beta blockers. You have to see why they're on the medication. And in other patients, because they're great um, chronotropic agents and slow your heart rate down, especially through the AV node, uh, withdrawal of a beta blocker can precipitate serious ventricular tachyarrhythmias. Or if folks are on beta blockers like metoprolol for, let's say, uh, rate control and AFib or a flutter, again, cessation of the medication can lead to rapid ventricular response. Uh, so just... Big picture, I, I typically hold these medicines when blood pressures are low, 90 or 95 systolic. I hold them in patients who I'm worried are septic because uh, even though their pressure may be 130 over whatever, when I check them, that next blood pressure could potentially be even lower. Um, anyone who has dizziness, syncope, while we're trying to figure out the etiology, anyone with orthostasis, anyone who's dehydrated, I consider holding blood pressure medicines and in specific the um, volume-based ones like the thiazides. So it sounds like back to the beta blockers, if I'm a pediatrician taking care of a patient who's on a beta blocker, unless I can find out why they're on it, I'm more likely to hold one of the other antihypertensives if they have more than one. Absolutely. Um, and again, not that beta blockers aren't used for it, their antihypertensive effect. They really aren't commonly used as first line anymore unless the patient specifically has another indication to be on them, such as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or coronary artery disease. 
And those patients are going to be typically older, and ideally, pediatricians aren't, aren't going to be taking care of them because they're more complicated. Absolutely. And, you know, based on some of the preliminary tri triage guidelines and algorithms we've seen and speaking to some of the folks who are already taking care of COVID patients um, or just other general adult patients, they're trying to get them the, you know, less than 35 year old, not as many comorbidity patients. So, again, ideally, because if you think about it, one of my concerns, and I guess we'll talk about it when we get the chest pain, which is one of our questions, is um, if you find out someone has chest pain and it's an MI, you're going to want to potentially have to get them to a center where they can be catheterized and have stents placed. And maybe your pediatric facility is not a place where that can be done. So a lot, again, a, a big part of all of this is making sure we appropriately triage the right kind of patients who are going to go to um, pediatric hospitals or pediatric floors. Well, I think that's a great segue to our next question, which is evaluating chest pain in an adult. Oh, fantastic. So this is one that gives everybody anxiety. I think even people who see it all the time, uh, and the easiest thing or way to think about it is what are the, the, the can't miss diagnoses? At least that's how I like to frame it. And really there's only a handful. And I like to think about them as cardiac specific ones, pulmonary specific ones, and then vascular causes of chest pain. I'll kind of do the cardiac one last because I think that's the one everyone's worrying about. So we can talk about the other ones that are easier to rule out. Really any acute aortic syndrome in the vascular category of adult chest pain. Uh, so your penetrating ulcers, your intimal tears, aortic dissections, they, they're, they present very classic. It's very hard to miss this. There's very rarely do you have a silent sort of dissection. Um, so if you have that sudden tearing pain uh, sort of on the ch front side of the chest, sometimes radiating to the back, depending on the kind of dissection you have, BP differential between the arms, it's pretty easy to, from a clinical standpoint, figure out this may be going on. And if that's what you suspect, CT angiography is the sort of um, diagnostic modality of choice. And then based on that, you know, some of them, I don't want to go into too many details unless you think it'll be helpful. There's type A dissections, type B dissections. Some require surgical management, some require medical management. But either way, at that point, hopefully you're at a place where you can call a rapid response, um, have some sort of specialist consultant who can help you out with the next steps. Yeah, that could be a whole lecture by itself, but I don't know that we have time for all that. It, it very well could. Um, from a pulmonary standpoint, things that are more common in adults and are in children that we may want to make sure we don't miss uh, are, I would say, pneumothorax and a pulmonary embolism. Uh, pneumothorax, though, children still have, so I think our pediatric colleagues would still be able to recognize that. Uh, anyone who's had maybe a recent procedure, uh, emphysema, COPD patients may have ruptured blebs. Uh, but it presents, you know, sudden onset, maybe some absent breath salads on one side. Uh, so that's one that you don't want to miss, but it doesn't usually present the same way maybe an acute coronary syndrome would. And then PE is actually um, a reasonably common one in adults, and we see all the time. So patients who are, are coming are complaining of you know pleuritic chest pain, tachycardia, maybe they might be hypoxic. They have risk factors for class like immobility or malignancy. Uh, these may be folks who, are, who have a PE instead. I want to bring up a, a couple of quick tools you can use. You can look them up online on MD Calc or any of these other online calculators that quickly let you know whether or not your patient may have a PE. One is called the Wells criteria. Uh, you can quickly look through, and if your patient has even more than a single point, they're considered to have moderate risk. You also there are a set of rules called the PERC. P-E-R-C, you can look those up too. If you say no to every single question, it has a very high negative predictive value, and you can quickly say, you know what, my patient probably doesn't have a PE. Uh, but if you're worried about PE, again, the, the test of choice would be a CT uh, PE protocol. It might it, Every place I've been at has a different name for it, but basically it's a CT chest with contrast. Um, now, if your patient has kidney injury or cannot use contrast, uh, for any reason, you may have to go through a VQ scan, but I would always talk to your radiologist to see what's available if you're considering that they may have a PE. Uh, lastly, I want to move to what I think most people are worried about, which is, is my patient having an acute coronary syndrome? So an STEMI, uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction, or an NSTEMI, unstable angina, is that what's going on? So the classic teaching, of course, is that sort of central pressure, crushing, radiating to the left arm, or really either arm, diaphoresis, nausea. Um, especially in patients who may have known peripheral artery disease or coronary artery disease. And if you see that, that's maybe a slam dunk, very easy for you to recognize. But I think the important thing 
um, to know is that there are sort of three groups of people I like to think of who don't present with that classic presentation. Uh, I'm sure you've heard that women may have atypical presentations, the elderly can have atypical presentations, and then folks with diabetes, which is of course a common comorbidity, can also have a very atypical presentation and may not present the same way. So I would have a very low index of suspicion. Uh, like most other things, like when you were talking about delirium, if you're worried that your patient may have an acute coronary syndrome, seeing the patient getting a quick focused history, figuring out the quality, onset, severity, radiation, what makes it better or worse, whether they have a history of an MI or coronary artery disease will quickly help you figure out uh, what's going on. The, the immediate test to do is to get cardiac biomarkers. Uh, nearly every hospital will have a troponin of some variety with various cutoffs depending on the kind of troponin you have as well as getting EKGs um, every 10 to 15 minutes until your chest pain resolves. And you can kind of watch and see if they have uh, dynamic changes. So ST, T wave changes are what you want to look for. And similar to how time is brain in a stroke, time is heart tissue. So having a rapid response team of any kind called early, um, if you have cardiology readily available, if you do see ST changes or that troponin comes back elevated, um, I would say very quickly then escalating to the next step. But really, the, as long as you can look at a patient and quickly just get an EKG and a troponin if you're worried about acute coronary syndrome, for the most part, you will very quickly catch that. It's always helpful to have a baseline EKG to see if there's any changes, but you don't always have the luxury of having had an EKG before. Now, Vic, when I trained, uh, one of the things we would see sometimes is this 20 or 30-year-olds coming in with chest pain. And then if we did our exam and it was reproducible chest pain, and maybe we did an EKG mm -hmm. and there wasn't anything concerning... Uh, we I, at that point would say this is not an MI. You're fine. So that's right. A lot of people say if the pain is reproducible, it's likely musculoskeletal in nature, and it's caused a chondritis. Um, and I'm not sure. I have to look this up to see if there's very specific data that shows how sensitive or specific uh, probable sort of chest pain, reproducible chest pain is. But I would say that it's still something that I would have um, a low index. Of suspicion, I would, or rather, a low, th lower threshold to think about MI, because I have certainly seen many patients who have reproducible chest pain who have ended up having an MI as well. Okay. Uh, if they're younger and have lower risk factors, of course, less likely. So hopefully that would be the case if that's the sort of patient you're seeing. And but um, the older patients, again, because they can present so atypically, I would say that reproducible chest pain uh, shouldn't automatically tell you that this is likely not to be an acute coronary syndrome. Now, let me ask you this, and it's kind of a question of you going about your lo normal logistics. If you have a medication a patient's on, and, and like sometimes I'll forget what a medication is or the side effects or the adverse events, uh, what do you go to in terms of looking something up? So I think everyone may have different resources. Um, the last two hospital systems that I spent most of my time in um, and the two that I have here all you have Lexicom which we can readily access from our phone. Um, and I think that's linked to up to date as well, uh, that quickly can talk that, to give you sort of that information. Uh, but I'm sure that every system has a resource that they're linked to that gives them that sort of information. All right. So now we're about 40 some minutes in. Why don't we, well, we can either do diabetes or goals of care. Let's, let's just go down the list. We'll go do diabetes. We'll see how long we go. Sure. This may be a long one. Okay. I don't know how much we're gonna. Uh, people are gonna be starting insulin on a COVID nineteen mm -hmm. patient. I think the bigger question would yeah. be when to stop it. What if I were seeing a patient? And I'm a pediatrician, and the patient's not doing great. What are my? Uh, what should I know? When should I stop the insulin or stop, the, especially the long acting glargine and levomere? So. Uh, inpatient management of diabetes, of course, is like a talk we give to residents and students multiple times when we're on service. We often spend an hour on it. But we'll try to make it a lot more simple for what we envision a pediatrician may face, which is if you're taking care of someone who is coming into the hospital and you're admitting them, um, if they have any oral uh, hypoglycemic agents, we always hold them because we want to have better control over their sugars in the hospital. We have a lot of interruptions of someone's diet. People are made NPO all the time. So we actually hold all of them to help prevent hypoglycemia because the biggest principle of inpatient uh, type 2 diabetes management is to avoid extremes, avoid hypoglycemia, and avoid hyperglycemia. We don't anticipate that you will be starting insulin on anybody um, in the hospital or a COVID-19 patient. Um, but if they're already on insulin, one thing I note is that most folks don't really adhere to a carb-consistent 
gluten or carb control diet at home, or they may not adhere to the same restrictions that are placed in the hospital when you put them on a carb control diet. So whenever someone is on Lantus, um, which is Glargine, the most commonly used one that I see, uh, I usually give them maybe 75% of their dose or half of their dose even, and then put them on a rapid acting sliding scale to help me uh, make sure that they aren't too hyperglycemic because, again, we want to prevent hypoglycemia. So I like to start low and then work my way up. Um, most places will have an order set where you have a sliding scale for, you know, every 50 above 100. You can add X units depending on whether it's a high, normal, or low sliding scale that you're ending up using. But again, big picture, I think, hold the oral hypoglycemic agents. If they're not on insulin, you're, that means that they were probably well controlled with just their oral agents. And you may not need to start, but I would definitely check their sugars. Um, we often do ACHS, so before meals and at night. And then if they're on insulin, um, if there's a long acting, I like to cut it a little bit first, 50 to 75%. It's sort of more of a, I think, an art than a science sometimes. And then kind of go from there. Uh, it, you know, there's lots of ways we can talk about if you are insulin naive and you have to start insulin, how to do the basal bolus correction. And if you know anyone has questions, they can always reach out to us by email, I'm happy to answer them. But Tony, do you think that covers what um, people were hoping to get out of diabetes? I know that this would be a very broad topic. Yeah, it could be a, a multiple hours, but let me ask you this. If I have a patient in respiratory distress, uh, maybe they're on CPAP or BiPAP, and they're not really able to eat at all because they're in this distress, uh, and then they, they're on Lantus or Levimir. Should I keep, uh, should I cut it in half or should I stop it altogether at that point until they're better? So that's, a, that's a great question. I think part of that answer depends on how much insulin they require. Of course, if this is a type 1 diabetic, different answer altogether. They require a basal amount of insulin at all times, so I would never cut it entirely. But I think in a patient who, who is unable to eat and maybe they have a BiPAP mask on, um, depending on where their sugars are and the degree of control they have, if someone, I mean, you may be, you may not be surprised to find people who have 60 units of insulin as they're long acting. And if that's the case, cutting it all together could potentially lead to very poorly controlled episodes of hyperglycemia. You may want to cut it in half. But if someone doesn't have a huge long acting insulin requirement anywhere from 15 or below, I think it would be quite safe to actually hold it all together as long as you're making sure to check their sugars. So. Um, again, inpatient type 2 diabetes management can go, go on and on, and we do hours of lecture and months of an internal medicine residency talking about it. But one very good resource that is actually on the Popcorn webpage as well, if you go to Yale20.com, they have a series of 20 lectures uh, made by their internal medicine program, but they have an excellent 20-minute primer on the management of inpatient diabetes. The Yale20 group was very wonderful enough to um, allow us to link to their resource and have it be open to everyone. But if you want to go into more of the granular how do I manage inpatient uh, diabetes and type 2 diabetics in adults? I think the diabetes talk that they have is absolutely fantastic. Okay. All right. I think that's great. Now, our last question from, our, um, from those who are doing this right now are goals of care, end-of-life discussion. And I'm assuming what they mean is they, they, either have, they probably have a younger patient, hopefully, and things aren't going well, and they want to have this discussion that this patient may never have had yet. So what do you, how do you go about it, Vic? So I think one big thing I want to make sure that I get across is that um, goals of care are often conflated with code status discussions. Uh, I like to think of them as two different things. Code status is its own thing, but a goals of care is literally what it says. What are What is our patient hoping to have um, as their outcome from coming into the hospital and getting treated, whether it's, you know, I want to go back so I can get back to my college classes or I want to, you know, continue doing X, Y, Z sports. And so that helps knowing what they really want helps give us a reasonable perspective uh, and a reasonable objective of what we can get them to. So this is hard and it's more challenging because I've had more goals of care conversations with younger patients recently than I've ever had to in the past. And so I actually, in the case of COVID, I start off saying that there's still so much we don't know about this disease process. And we know that seemingly young, healthy folks are being affected by this virus in ways that we've never seen before, potentially. Um, and for folks who start having that early oxygen requirement escalation as it starts going up, I like to address this as early as I can, because, you know, we often elect for early intubation in these patients to get them to the ICU. And sometimes, depending on how they do, that intubation, unfortunately, may have been the last time they're able to talk to their families, often through FaceTime because of all the visitor restrictions that we have. So I approach it mostly by telling them that, you know, there's a lot of unknowns that we don't know about this. 
ask them what are they hoping to get out of this be honest with them about you know i don't know what it may be but i think this is your best chance of what we have to do and for the most part our younger folks are having much better outcomes so that's reassuring um and then i tell them you know ask them if they've ever had these conversations and for the most part of course our younger folks haven't um even some of the my older patients haven't and you know try to make sure that they have the time to be able to talk to their family about what their wishes may be should it turn out that they may have to be on the ventilator for a prolonged period of time they may need a tracheostomy um if you know they go into some sort of shock and have brain damage these are not easy conversations to have and i can't say that I've had them as often prior to COVID, but uh, these are conversations that we're having earlier these days. So we've answered all the questions that were asked for us, Vig. Um, uh, if there's people are listening and you are a pediatrician and you're or whatever, a plastics or uh, a dermatologist, someone who doesn't normally take care of adults, and you're in an area that's greatly affected by COVID, and you have questions and you want someone, uh, some sort of a, a tutorial like this, a crash course at this, we can't cover everything. It's an entire residency. So we can cover things uh, in short snippets that we that can be helpful. Please write to the Popcorn Network. I'll try and put a link for the Popcorn Network's site on, on the podcast description. You're welcome to write to me, and I'll pass it along, and we'll also put together another episode. Um, for those people who are doing that, please feel free to email us. I hope this was helpful. I, I think we covered everything well, Vic. What do you think? Oh, I think so. Thank you so much for having me. I've been a long-time listener. I'm pretty honored to be be on the show with thee, Dr. Tony. Uh, um, so, no, thank you so much, and I, I hope this helped. And, again, if it would help to have my email address, I'm happy to, to share that with anyone who may have any questions. Or, uh, But, again, the Popcorn Network I think will be fantastic. Uh, they'll have one-pagers that are coming up daily on multiple topics, including high-yield inpatient medicine topics. We have six major conditions that you you don't want to miss if you're not used to taking care of adults. I think the website, even though this thing has only been around, this network's been around for maybe two to three weeks at most, it's very rapidly, um, the website's getting better every day. Yeah, I'm impressed with how much you guys have put together as a collaborative effort so quickly. It's, it's really wonderful. And for, the, for those who are listening, we're going to have another episode on the podcast in a couple of days on the pulmonary um, differences between the pediatrics and adult uh, in terms of asthma and then, of course, COPD and how COVID's affecting the lungs. So we're going we're gonna to get to that, and I'm going to get these churned out as quickly as I can. So I'm going to take this time, and I'm going to thank you again, Vic, for coming on. I really appreciate your time. No, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, for everybody else, if you're one of the pediatricians out there working, seeing adults, I want to thank you. Uh, you're putting yourselves out there. You're putting your lives on the line, no sugarcoating it. Um, and I appreciate it. I know you're doing your service, uh, but it's heroic. Thank you for doing it. If we can help in any way we want to, everybody, we will get through this. I want to thank the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh for supporting this podcast and my division, the Paul C. Gaffney Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine. Of course, Dr. Megan Keen Tarchichi helps me with everything. And when I hope we will get back to non-COVID topics on the podcast at some point soon. Uh, but until this whole mess is over, we'll keep churning out anything we can that, we, that you think will help. Please write to us and let us know. 